to all my sweet babies that I need to learn as well. Uh, early converted to 2002, refunded it into the 2012. I thought that completely eliminated the 2002 bond. It's not saying here that both series require annual debt service payments. Are we still paying debt service on the 2002 after it's been refunded into the 2012? I don't believe so. Well, it seems like we sold it out, didn't we? You sold it out in preference to a 2012. We refunded the 2002 bonds as part of the 2012 bond. So the companions then, the one wasn't dissolved, or? No, the 2002 bond was paid off, and we received the reserve funds that were being held in cash when the bond was terminated. That's sort of what I understood. It's saying here that we're still paying annual debt service with a termination in 2025. It says both series require annual debt service payment. I, got told, I don't understand bonds, but I thought that we'd put one behind us and reestablish. Debt service payments are all into the 2012 bond. Oh, okay. I think they. It's both. It's both. It's both. It's both. It's both. All right, that's fine. It's nothing critical. It's just just a curious question. You're not sure I'm I'm trying to remember. It's been a while. Right. I think technically they have it listed as a 2012A and a 2012B. Is no, that correct? Is that the 2010? Yeah. That that's, that's the 2010 bonds. 2010 bonds with two or A bonds with general general revenue. Go ahead. Yeah. Because of the, I'm pretty sure that this sounds weird, but the 2002 bonds are still alive. And when we did the refinancing on the 2012 bonds, what we did was we funded an account to repay those so that we could basically take them off of our balance sheet. And so they're, they're effectively refunded because there's a pot of money sitting there to, to defease them, as they call it. And therefore, that's why it's not showing up as part of the debt service down the bottom. Well, that's what the next paragraph shows after the one I was curious about. And I think that's explaining then. You say it's sort of a escrow account. It's, it's covered, but... Uh, we have no interest in it. I mean, it's just we took a pot of money and put it down to pay off the 2002 as they became due. But they're still trying to... Right. And they're still there. Right. I have a question on the bonds. On the payoff schedule, I've just never seen it where it inflates so much, like particularly, I mean, it looks like on the 2012, the payments go up over 100000 by the end, and then on the second one, I wonder if this is 2034 to 2035, the payment will be $1.2 million, whereas 2014, we're at 350000 Are the payments going up? So, sorry, I'm going to get, yeah, I get, I'm not sure if that's, so that's cumulative. So that's not per okay. year. Okay, is that, but it's not on this first page, it's only on the second page? No, Because it couldn't be cumulative when you land it for 472 well, on this. If you're doing two years there at 1.2 million, that you means got you've got five years from 19 to 23, you've only got one year from 24 to 25. Yeah. So it is going up right. at the end. Correct, Why Sorry. is that? Why does it go up at the end with those large payments? I don't understand the question. From 14 to 255 to 25 to 450. Page 19, the 234 to 235. We've got the 1.2 million doing, uh, split between the two years. You know, that's over 600,000 a year. So why is it that it's, it's going up? It's structured so that the payments are going, getting bigger. Uh, the coupon rate increases over those time periods. If you look at the preliminary official statements for those bonds, you can see the interest on each of the coupon rates per year. And sure. the interest goes up to 7% on some of them. I was going to ask that too, 7%? Well, well, what, well, happens well, is, what happens is you get to the refunding opportunity and you roll those bonds over if the interest rate favors it at that time, which is what we did with the 2002 bonds. We had to wait a year to refund the 2002 bonds 
why we didn't refund the 2002 bonds in 2010 is that we hadn't reached the payoff opportunity to do it without a penalty. In 2012, we were in that, and so we refunded those bonds to avoid the higher interest on the coupons that were issued during that period. And Bart, you'd have to have a counting sense to that, but that's my understanding. We got a little 90,000 when Charleston follows the same pattern. Uh -huh. The interest goes up, and the principal, it, it, it's strange. The total payment goes up then. Yeah, it, it must be the way we do bonds, and I don't understand that much. But I say on a 90, it's showing sort of the same, the same approach. There's no penalty, but it's not in our advantage to refund them prior to that time. We lose money in doing so. Well, this has a big numbers of interest, so it seems like you've saved that money. Wow. Would we save all that interest if we prepaid it? That's a big Well, we, I mean, we, well, we talked with our, our bond people was a month ago. And I mean, they just look at us and say, oh, just keep being patient. Our day's going to come. We will, we will re, we'll readdress these bonds before we start taking a major dip. I mean, it's just right now with the interest rates where they're at and our current interest rate on our bonds, we are we're better off to keep them where they're at. Right? So there's penalties for Especially yeah, with our bonds. A little bit higher than change on the interest, interest rates it's on. It's just like if you got a 3.2 interest rate on your home, and interest rates right now are four and a quarter, are you going to refinance? Mm -hmm. Right, you lose money. Yeah. It just seems like 7% is so much higher than whatever the interest rates are. But we're not at 7% right now. But some of them are, it says 3 to 7, does it? It says that But those are in the later years. Those are in the later years. It start um, during the, are, I mean, they, these bond is, that's one of the first things I looked at, mainly because it's one of the biggest stacks on the desk when I took the job. And I was just amazed at it. Like, what in the world is going on with these interest rates? Because they they are projected to up and down and around and around. So I mean it's it is one of those things where I mean, you kinda have to it's like uh, Bob was saying, you kinda have to understand the bonds. Um, I, I think you've been invited to the bond school that's gonna happen in June. But the, the other thing too is, is that when we look at it, when we do a bond offering, we look we look at the beginning. Like so, when we did one in 2010, we looked at the interest rate for the entire 30-year period and came up with a weighted average interest rate that was appropriate at that time when we went into it. So in it. And it has some really low ones for the short term ones and high ones at the end. And it's a whole a whole series of different interest rates. And each each year can have its own bond. So you could have two year bonds, five year bonds, ten year bonds. Each one of them is a little bit different as far as the interest rate. Well, between the extremes, the yeah. high. And what we do is we look at the overall history of the interest and the cost and we come up with what it's going to, what the overall average is when we, when we do the financing. Then as we move down the road, if, if the interest rates are favorable, then we refinance. I know that George K. Baum, John Crandall was principal of George K. Baum. I know he'd be happy to come up and spend an hour with you if you'd like to commit the time and just uh, uh, give you a basic introduction. <laughs> The specifics as it relates to our two issues. Is that bond council? I just wish yeah. I had a lot of money. No, that's that not bond council. We were council. issuing the bonds because I would want to have some percent interest rate. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Romney yeah. would have gone for the 70% percent interest rate too. Financial. financial. And I'm sure they'd both be willing to come up and uh, host a session with you. To, well, for any questions, and to just give you a general outline of the bond that we have, show you the payment histories, uh, how you are in the POSs that you got, you know, yes. all yes, of those schedules are in there. Yeah. So we did sorry, we didn't notice anything unusual with these bonds. These are fairly typical for the industry, right? Interest rates typically increase. Whenever you want, I'd love to drive out here. Um, 
I think I, were, I mean we're planning on doing starting quarterly reviews. Um, so for the end of June. So I'm not sure. I don't think we schedule. Actually, that's the way it works anyway. You do an audit and you have two quarters in between the other audit. So it's just a two auxiliary. Right. Again, I mean, we're glad to come up as frequently as you would like. Um, we're always open for discussions. With that. And I think a big part of that will be you know, continued you know, recommendations for improvements and internal controls. Could I make a suggestion? And I don't know, for me, I, I like to tie notes in with uh, data. And if somehow you can, next time we do an audit, of course, we should have taken care of this before we ever got here, the audit committee, but we, we didn't. Uh, if you could put footnotes that would lead us from a data entry to a note relating to that, that would be exceptional. Right now, you know, I, I tried, I, I had correlated data with notes, but that would help a lot. I don't know whether that's a hard thing for you, probably not. As you know, with this particular entry, well, we explained that page on down the, on down the way. So. Right. Typically, um, I mean, most of the notes will um, reference this first page, the statement in that position, um, and just kind of follow that in order. Uh, that's kind of a management preference um, as to whether we put actual footnotes on this. Well, knowing that, that then, I could just go back to the written notes and follow down, and quite a bit of things, or most everything, would be identified somewhere down, down the way. Correct. Right. So, kind of, it starts with note three, um, is your cash and investments, which would be your very first item okay. on the statement in that position. So that's kind of just management's right. preference well, whether they want to link that up and knowing we'd be that, glad to uh, accommodate either way. Well, I that. don't think we have any issue of going on that. Mm -hmm. The notes start where then we got statement of net and the notes will start on that. Bob, let me make a suggestion. I mean, I understand the comment, but if you look at the notes, you'll have like lots of notes. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not, well, I guess you could do end notes, that way you push them off to the end. That which is basically what you have to make them. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, but where do these notes start? We got the uh, statement of net position, and what page did you say we'd start seeing, seeing information, starting into assets and moving on down the page? So it'll start with note 3 on page 13. So these are kind of expanded clarification okay. on right. items. That are on the statement of net position. And subsequent pages will probably refer back to the right. statement of net. Right. So then note four is capital assets, and that just provides additional information All right. on that and now. So not every item on the statement of net position will be more into note. Well, if you have, you can scratch that request. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that I have seen it both ways though. Um, so again. I think it's just see the essence. Do you have an example of your concerns? You know, typically all I see is, so like on this statement in that position on page six, uh -huh. it would just say cash and cash equivalents, and then in parentheses, it would oh, say no. C note three, oh, I've seen that. and link that. Yeah, so, I see, I take you to page 15, which, and I did this one in particular, 15 actually talks about that up at the top of page 15. So it doesn't necessarily fall, fall directly. Right. It, it's it sort was, of a game I play when I get yeah. <laughs> That's right. And then, then things like trade accounts. I think it's I think it's noted in the notes. Trade accounts I have deciphered is paid from customers, but does it also include construction work or contributed capital, or is it just money from our rate payers? Right. Trade accounts would typically be money from your rate payers. And so, but there's not specifically, I don't think there's a note specifically for trade accounts receivable. I think I've got that just asking questions of staff, so. 